morning. morning. How's everybody today? Now that I got everybody's attention, good morning. morning. Oh, that sounded wonderful. I'm glad you all are here. How many of you had just a little bit of chill this morning? Yep, Yep, love it. I was going to say, some of you love it, some of you despise it. Some of you are going to be cold now until April. Those fingers are always going to be blue, right? Well, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you come out. I hope your anticipation is to worship the Most High God. Amen? Amen. To be in His presence and to be in the presence of His children in fellowship at the same time this morning. Amen? Amen. Well, it's, a, it's an exciting day. Here we are headed headlong into fall. The colors are getting vibrant. Um, can't God paint wonderfully? Yes. Not an artist in the world like our, like our Heavenly Father. He can put the most majestic colors And just the simplest of things, like the sky, can be just lit up at night. It's beautiful, isn't it? Well, it's also beautiful in the eyes of the Lord that His saints gather, and that we worship Him, that we praise Him, and that we adore Him because of who He is. Amen? And He is everything that we need. So I hope you come this morning with a cup, expecting to fill it up uh, with fellowship and with blessing. So let's start off with some announcements this morning. And then we'll get into our songs of worship. Sister Terry, if you would, come on. (laughs) We're going to have a whole gallery. (laughs) That one one was probably a do not issue one. Good morning. morning. Uh, Follow along with me in your bulletin. We're going to look at uh, select things. If uh, you want to sign up to be an usher or door greeter, there are sign-up sheets in the back. And also put your name and phone number so then David will have that and allow him to get in touch with you. Uh, the amount that Calvary gave to the Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief Fund was $1,325. We had some extra donations. So thank you, Calvary, for that donation. Uh, Operation Bless Frankfurt is in full swing. And if you'll just note on the back of your bulletin here, it has all the different dates that we'll be doing uh, Operation Bless Frankfurt activities back there. Our Eliza Broad Estate offering uh, also is going on at this time. And you can read there about it. <clears throat> and next week, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this amazing woman that our state mission offering is named about. Uh, If you'll turn over in the bulletin on the back there, it says leaflets for the fall and winter needs for the shelters are back there on the table. Well, if you can find them, good for you, because they're not there yet. (laughs) I am uh, talking to both of the shelters on Monday, uh, but next Sunday we will have lists that will be available. Um, come on down to upcoming events, uh, church council meeting. There's going to be a full week this week. Church council meeting Monday night at 530 with Bible study uh, at 1 p.m. on Tuesday. Homeless Mats ministry meets that night. And remember, it's a new time, 530 p.m. On Wednesday night, we will have a short called business meeting on the 12th. And then on the 14th is our bonfire. There is a sign-up sheet in the back for that. Uh, They just need more or less, I think, a head count of who's coming. And also there is a new time. It's not 6 p.m. It's at 5.30 p.m. Um, And then on November the 5th at 9.30 a.m., the ladies that want to make, well, or gentlemen, I guess, that want to make a pine pine cone wreath, There's a sign-up sheet for that also, so please make note of that. Well, thank you so much. And for much, some of us that went to the <laughs> 
God enfold you with His Spirit and His love. Let Him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let Him have the things that hold you and His Spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your lamps. Jesus, oh Jesus, Come and fill your land. Sing with me. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is peace. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is love. There is comfort in life's darkest hour. There is light and life. There is help and power in the Spirit, in the Spirit of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful for the Spirit of the Lord. And we ask, Father, this morning as we gather here in your name, that you would make your presence and your spirit known to us in a very strong way. Father, we crave your peace and your love and the comfort that you offer us. And we praise you for all of those things. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning to you. So good to see you. Let's find a hymn book together and turn with me to an old, old song. There is power in the blood. Let's stand and sing it together. <clears throat> Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. In the blood of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's one power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood. Service for Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power.
Be seated, please. Good morning. My verses are going to deal with the word anger. If anger isn't under control, it's just one letter away from danger. I'm reading from the Good News Translation, starting with Proverbs 29.11. Stupid people express their anger openly, but sensible people are patient and hold it back. Proverbs 14, 29. If you stay calm, you are wise. But if you have a lot of temper, you only show how stupid you are. Stupid in these verses is referring to not having common sense for good conduct and behavior. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, passion and anger. No more shouting or insults. No more hateful feelings of any sort. Instead, be kind and tender hearted to one another and forgive one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. Thanks to Sharon's joke last Sunday, caused me to feel to share this. A woman driver who was in a hurry got frustrated with the driver in front of her because he was courteous to the pedestrians at the crosswalk and, sh and stopped and let them cross. She got upset that she hit the roof of her car, honked her horn, was screaming and shouting at him, even shaking her fist at him out of her frustrations because she was in a hurry to get through that intersection. She heard a tap on her window, looked up, and in her face was a very serious police officer. He ordered her to exit her car with her hands up, he took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. After a couple hours, she was escorted back to where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, giving rude gestures, shaking your fist at the driver in front of you and call, cursing a blue streak at him. But I noticed the choose life license plate holder. The what would Jesus do bumper sticker. The follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker. And the chrome plated Christian fish emblem on the back of the car. Naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> Don't let anger turn into danger. I think you got one more. Next week we'll talk about stealing. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about stealing next week. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Let's find the hymn book once again. Just remain seated and let's sing together the first and last verses of Trusting Jesus. 417 is where you'll find it. Simply 
trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus, that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whatever befall, trusting Jesus, that is all, trusting Him while life shall last, trusting till the earth be past, till within Jasper wall, trusting Jesus, that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him, whatever befall, trusting Jesus. That is all. I read to you a poem by one Robert Browning. I'm guessing that there are some of you out here today who have had moments in your life where you just wished, God, just wrap your arms around me and hold me tight. I really need it. And I suspect there are a number of you who would testify that you, that's exactly what has happened to you in those times. Mr. Browning puts it this way. If I forget, yet God remembers, if these hands of mine cease from their clinging, yet the hands divine hold me so firmly that I cannot fall. And if sometimes I am too tired to call for him to help me, then he reads the prayer unspoken in my heart and lifts my care. I dare not fear, since certainly I know that I am in God's keeping, shielded so from all else would harm me. And in the hour of stern temptation, strengthened by his power, I tread no path in life to him unknown. I lift no burdens, bear no pain alone. My soul a calm, sure hiding place has found the everlasting arms my life surround. The Apostle Paul said it this way in his letter to the Thessalonians. The Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. to sing something with me. I want you to learn a little chorus because when I come to the chorus, I want you to sing it with me. He will hold me fast. Sing that. He will hold me fast. Do it again. That's not good enough. He will hold me fast. That could seem the same thing, just a little higher. He will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so. Sing that. For my Savior loves me so. Mm -hmm. He will hold me Good. Sing that whole chorus with me. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. When I fear my faith will fail. 
Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail he will hold me fast I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold he must hold me fast sing with me he will hold me fast he me so he will hold me fast nice those he saves are his delight Christ will hold me fast Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last, bought by him at such a cost. He will hold me fast. He So he will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last. He are coming forward to receive the morning tithes and offerings. Thank you for helping me out with that song. You did that pretty. <laughs> Compared to not pretty. Ralph, would you ask God to bless our offering? Most precious heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you this day and thank you for the service that we're about to have, Lord. We pray for this offering that you take it up, Lord, and make it for you to glorify you. And what we're saying do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
thank everybody involved in that, even the audience for helping out. Y'all sounded great. Had you ever sung that before? Is that a brand new one? Wonderful. That was beautiful. Glad that everybody was joining in on that. Did I get my headset on? I guess I did. All right. I can hear myself in stereo now. That's always a little unnerving, uh, especially when it starts singing back at me. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into God's Word and continue this wonderful flow of worship this morning. Thank you, Brother Ed. Um, changing anger to danger. That's very creative. He, was, he had that sign up, and I was reading danger on the backside, and he kept saying anger. I thought, well, there's a typo. Um, I was wrong. He knew what he was doing. Thank you for that. What a, what a well-applied um, illustration as well. Um, I've had those people behind me at traffic lights. Have, have you all? Yes. Um, I, I just love the, the fact that um, the bumper stickers kind of say one thing and our mouth says something different, doesn't it? can catch us a little bit off guard. Well, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. We're going to move on with the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul as he and Silas and Timothy and Luke at times were traveling around uh, planting new churches, meeting new people, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And last week we saw them at Philippi. They were arrested and they were thrown in chains and they were, they were kept. And we also saw that the house of the Philippian jailer was converted completely to Christ because of the testimony. Well, it's time to move on from Philippi. I could spend more time there, but I will not. So uh, let's open with a word of prayer. And then I'll read some scripture and, and speak as we go from the Bible. We're going to cover the entirety of Acts chapter 17. And all God's people said, oh my. <laughs> so y'all listen fast and, and we'll get to where the Lord desires us to end this morning. Father God, thank you again for bringing us together. Lord, I thank you for the saints that love you so much that gather here, Father, at Calvary. We worship you. We praise you. We adore you. Father, thank you for your word that you give us in song. Father, thank you for speaking to us in song and, and lifting us, Father, to that place of a worship. Uh, listening to, lifting us to that place where we can see clearly and we can understand, Father, your, your majesty and we can understand how you walk with us and you carry us and you keep us. And, Father, how you convict us when we're where we need not to be. Father, I pray you go with us now as we open up the Bible. Father, teach us from the life of Paul and Silas. Father, help us to learn this day how things are not much dissimilar today than they were in this, in this day that Paul was in Athens. I pray you'll open our mind to understand what you have for us. And it's in your glorious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, so from Philippi, now they're kind of moving south through Asia Minor, and they've been going to these different places. Of course, Philippi was a Roman colony, and we talked about what that meant, but, but they weren't finished. And so if you'll read the end of chapter 16, you'll see that they were released. It's one of those things, they were taken and they were beaten, and then, and then they come by the next morning and said, just let them go. Just let those guys go. And then Paul, of course, Paul being contrary as he is, says, uh, so you're going to take a Roman citizen and beat them unlawfully, and you're just going to want us to leave quietly? Well, they had no idea that they were Roman citizens. So that changed how everything happened from that moment on. But they really wanted Paul to leave before they got in trouble with Rome. And so when they check in at Lydia's house and the church that's being formed there and growing, they moved on. So starting in 17, it says, Now when they had passed through Amph Amph Amphipi Amphipol well, Amphibolus and Apol Apollonia. How do you like those words, Right? I had that this morning. Anyway, they came to Thessalonica. Now, you've heard of Thessalonica. Yeah, we get, we get the book written by Paul to Thessalonians. That's Thessalonica or Thessaloniki. Depends on how you pronounce it. So that's where they went. And when they were in the synagogue of the Jews, Paul went in, as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas and did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. So where to go again? He went into the synagogue and he began to preach that Jesus is the Messiah, the prophesied Messiah that has come and that he was crucified. And he showed them from what we call the Old Testament, they would call it the Scriptures, that Jesus, this was part of the plan all along. Well, all these foreigners again began to believe in what Paul was preaching and then the people of, of God's calling, the people of the Old Testament, the Jews, were jealous. 
they were envious of that, that the door was open and, and different folks were coming in. And so they, they caused a little bit of trouble. And as they were causing trouble, I won't read the rest of the account, um, they basically had to hide. And so the disciples sent Paul on ahead. They said, you need to get out of here. Go on down to Berea. Now, if you read that, you'll see he went on down to Berea. And he kind of done the same thing when he got to Berea. And when he got there, it says in the Scripture that the Bereans were more noble than them at Thessalonica. Because they would go look at the Scripture and see if the things that he was teaching was correct. Well, once the Jews at Thessalonica found out that Paul was now preaching down in Berea, they got together a little posse and they rode down there to, to Berea and they began to raise trouble at Berea. And so the disciples again at that point says, we've got to get Paul out of here. These people are trying to kill him. So they sent him on down to a place called Athens. Have you heard of Athens? Now Athens is an interesting city. Athens itself is, as of today, over 3,000 years old. It's been continu continually inhabited for over 3,000 years. It was the absolute birthing place for what we call modern philosophy. It, 500 years before Christ... The philosophers were there. So you, you have Aristotle and you have Philo. You have these people that are well known in philosophy. They, they're thinkers in Athens. Now Athens was the main hub and, and they were very strong. At one point they were overthrown. And so things had changed. But they were still kind of the hub of Greek thinking. And that's a completely different kind of thinking than a lot of the other Middle Eastern places and things like that. Their philosophy and all these things. So this is where they send Paul after what happens at Thessalonica and after what happens at Berea. And I won't spend time in both of those cities, but in both of those cities, Paul was able to reach people with the gospel of Christ. And he did something he typically did. He would go into the synagogue where the Jews were gathering and he would begin to explain about these things. And he would go into the marketplace and he also explained to the Gentiles or the people that didn't have a Jewish background or weren't proselytes and, and he would begin to preach Jesus and him crucified. Not only him crucified but him risen bodily from the dead. That's, that's part of the gospel message. Amen? And that's, that's, that's a tripping point for a whole lot of people. That's a tripping point for a lot of people. When you, when you want to talk about this person was a great person or that person was a great person. Or in this era, when you talk about the gods that did this and the gods that did that and, and, and the mythological the stories that went along with that, well, people were willing to kind of accept it. But when you take a human being, died, and then rose again from the grave, that was a tripping point for a lot of people. And it still is today a tripping point for a lot of people that Jesus Christ got up from the grave. That's one of the things that they really, really struggle with. But if you take the resurrection away from the gospel, you do not any longer have what's called the good news. Amen? Amen. To, to, to die in your sins, the Bible tells us, is, is that we are, of, of all people, most miserable if we're still going to die in our sins, if we're not forgiven of the sins that separate us from Lord God Almighty. And so Paul, this is his message. This is what he would preach. He would go into the synagogue and he would take from the Old Testament, from their scripture, and he would say, listen, he would take them to like Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant. He would say, these are things that were necessary for the Messiah to suffer. And he, he was crucified. He died. He he was buried and on the third day he rose again and is now seated in the heavenlies with God the Father. We read that in Ephesians and several other of Paul's writings. So, so he's preaching this and it kind of bothered the Jews. They ran here, ran there, ran to the other place and now he's in Athens. And so when he gets to Athens, it's a completely different atmosphere. But, but I want you to see that Paul through prayer and, and subjugation to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, had presence of mind about him. He didn't just have a routine. He had presence of mind. He does things differently when we get there. Um, so in verse 16, it says, Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens. So they've, they've sent him ahead. And when he got there, he sent back. He said, You know, Silas and, and Timothy, y'all come on down and join me here in Athens. And while he's waiting on them to join him, they're, they're the rest of his entourage. They're the, the rest of his missionary traveling evangelistic team, if you will, like we see these days. It says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, and he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, that's not a strange thing in those days. Now, when you, when you would get around places where the, where the Jews were at, they, they had no idols of any kind because we have the commandments from way back in the Old Testament, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so they weren't known to have idols. But all the Gentile world had not only a few idols, but many idols, many gods that they served. As a matter of fact, 
Um, the name Athens comes from Athena, which was another god, a god of war, and, and she was a protector goddess and those kind of things. There was actually a conflict in, in the mythological writings, a conflict uh, between uh, Athena and another god, and they decided they were going to see who was going to rule Athens. Athens was a great place to rule. What was going to be the god over Athens? And, and, and the one god, I can't remember the name, um, touched the mountain, the, the Acropolis there, touched the mountain and salt water flowed. And Athena touched the mountain and an olive branch grew. And so they said, well, Athena is going to be our God. This is the kind of things that people believed about their cities. And this is the kind of thing that, that Paul was facing. So when he got there, he saw that the idol, the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in a synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Now that's something you don't hear written about a lot in Scripture. Those different philosophers and the different kinds of ways that they did things. And, and they were also conversing with him. And one said, what does this babbler wish to say? Now here's what's interesting. When, when you get there and you get in Athens, one of the things that they did was they discussed philosophy. That this is what they're known for. They would, they would kind of hang around this Acropolis, this, this hillside, and, and they would discuss different things of philosophy. Now, it's kind of all contained in, in a certain way that they didn't bring in a whole lot of new things. As a matter of fact, Socrates was poisoned here because he was teaching a different approach to things. You, you've heard of Socrates, the great philosopher. Well, he was teaching a different approach in this area, and he was put to death because of it. So you had to be careful, again, a lot like Philippi, about bringing in new religions. Now, this wasn't necessarily a Roman province like, like Philippi was, but, but they had these different teachings, and people liked to glean information. Uh, they, would be, they would be YouTubers today. Have you met a YouTuber? They know everything. No matter what you bring up, they know something about it. They've watched the video. Nothing wrong with that, but not all the things you see on YouTube are correct. Amen? I, 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 I won, at one moment, I'm flipping through. My, my feed is weird because I'm eclectic in my, in my studies and research. And so on, on one feed, I'll have these people telling us that the world is flat. I saw a video last night of one of the rockets that um, Musk has launched, and it went through what they called the firmament of the sky. They were showing this rocket go and these ripples coming out from it, and they believe that the sky, not very far up at all, is still all water, that we've not been to the moon, we've not left this firmament because God won't allow us to. That's on YouTube. That's people that believe that today. And then, and then the very next thing, is, it, it's, just, it's all over the place with what's on YouTube. And, and people can begin to chase these rabbit holes, and, and they get deeper, and they get deeper, and, and they're learning these little tidbits of facts into and, and where their whole life is surrounded by something that they watch on YouTube. Well, it's not on YouTube, but it's TikTok, and just there's all kinds of things. There's information running wild today. Well, think about this when you get to Athens. The Athenian people like to have information and tidbits, and they would like to discuss it. Too bad they didn't have YouTube then. They could get say, you know, I was watching so-and-so on YouTube last night in a live, and they were saying, I mean, just amazing how some people are so focused on that. Well, that's the Athenian culture. That's what they did. They, this was the, from 500 B.C., this was the hotbed of philosophy. This is where the, the Greek philosophy originated, and it came from that area. And so, so this is what they did. They, they gathered information, and they talked about things. So when Paul is there, and he's looking around, and he, he sees the town is given over to idols. There are idols everywhere. There's every form of worship you could think about. He begins to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And they thought, now what is this strange new teaching, this, this Jesus and, and this resurrection? What, what is this teaching of, of Jesus? So, that, so they wanted to know more from him, and, and they were very interested in that. And let me go on and finish reading. Others, um, what does this babbler wish to say? Others says he seems to preach a foreign di divinities because he was preaching Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Arachabas, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time doing nothing except hearing something new. So this is the focus of the town. It's interesting that you, you think about how supposedly 
Athens was formed. You, you think about the gods that they believed did this or did that. And you think about this is also there was, there was a great worship of the Olympian gods here on Mount Olympus. So there was all these different gods that they would worship. They would worship the Greek gods. They would also worship the Roman pantheon, which is almost identical but flipped over. They, they had gods everywhere, and this is what they did. But they thought Paul was preaching something strange. He was preaching Jesus Christ. He, he preached repentance from sin. Now, that's one of the biggest problems because it's okay to be a philosopher, but when you believe that people are guilty in sin, everybody's offended by that. And, and that Paul had a great way of doing that. If you read the first few chapters of Romans, you'll see he was really good about having everybody found guilty of sin. People don't want to hear that. Now, they, they want to hear a new philosophy. They want to hear a new way of thinking about things so that they could weigh it out. But when you present to them their need for a Savior, their need of forgiveness of sins in their life personally against a particular God, well, they struggle with that. And so they were, they were struggling with Paul. What, so what, let's, let's bring him up here on the Areopagus and let's talk about, let's talk about these things. We, we want to find out what you're talking about. And it's interesting, Paul began to, continues to speak to them. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. Okay, he wasn't being sarcastic there. Uh, he was saying, I, I can see that you mean business with religion. I can see that you're serious about the gods. Now, there's a little bit of history about Athens that makes that so. Let me go on. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription to the unknown god, which what... What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods to the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him, lest he actually, yet He is actually not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, For we are indeed His offspring. Now that's interesting. So here we have Paul. So let's go back and set the stage. We know just a little bit about Athens, and we don't need to know a lot about Athens to kind of figure out where they're at. But as Paul is walking around, he's grieved in his spirit. He, he wants to be an evangelist here. Now, we know his typical way of approaching things. He goes into the synagogue. He reasons with the people about Jesus, and then he has confrontation with the Jews that won't accept that, and he's got to run. That's typically been the way it's gone for Paul. So either he, he, he doesn't have any effect whatsoever, or he gets a chance to plant a church there. We know he planted a church in Philippi. We know that he planted a church in Thessalonica. Even though they came against him, there was a church founded in Thessalonica. So, so this is Paul's typical approach to things. And then he gets to this place where there's all these gods are worship. He goes into the synagogue, he reasons, some people became believers. But at the same time, while he's in the marketplace, while he's in the place where people were gathering, sharing ideas with one another, he's down there sharing his ideas. He, he's kind of philosophizing with them, if you will. He's, he's engaged in discussion. Now, one of the things you're going to have to understand about Paul is he's highly, highly educated. And he's highly, highly motivated to be the witness that God wants him to be. So as he's walking around the city when he first gets there, it says he's burdened. He's, he's perplexed in heart about all the foreign false gods that are being worshipped there. Now, Paul later on in his writings, he would say that when you worship a, a false god, you're actually worshipping a demon. Now people would take offense at that in Athens. So, so I want you to see that Paul... He saw what was going on, and he, I believe he was praying urgently in the Spirit, Lord, help me be your witness here. There's a certain way to approach different people. Have you noticed that? There's some people, the Bible tells us, that you can win them by the fear of hell. You can preach to them a, a devil's hell uh, due for all of those that die in their sin. But there's some that you can preach the love of God, and while they're still sinners, Christ died for them because He loved them. And you win them that way. So, so realizing that there are different ways to present the same gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Depending on who your audience is. 
Your, your audience makes a difference. When I stand before you all on a Sunday morning and I preach Jesus Christ crucified and risen, I'm preaching to a group of people by and large, if not completely, who believe that to be true. That's not always the case. A lot of times I don't have that kind of audience. When people find out that I'm a pastor, sometimes they kind of, okay, so what does that mean? Because you know what people understand about pastors these days. If you watch the news at all. Now, understand, their great-grandmas believed in Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. They, they don't know anything really about Jesus. I've talked to people recently who I know that there is spirituality in their family. I've talked to them about that. But they themselves really have no concept of who Jesus is or what he's done. They, they don't really understand. They, they kind of know there's an Easter. They're not sure what that's about. It has something to do with an empty tomb and a bunny rabbit. But other than that... They're not really sure what Easter's about. And, and they know that there's a Santa myth at Christmas time, and it has to do with baby Jesus. So, the, so they got baby Jesus, and they've got a crucified Jesus and an Easter bunny. They're, they're not sure how to put it together. So the way we approach these people has to be in accordance to who they are and what their understanding is. And Paul, being perplexed by the worship of idols in this town, which he knows the idols are only demons. He knows that, that they're worshiping demons, but you can't really hit people with that right off the bat. When you hit people with that right off the bat, uh, they don't know what to do with that. They, they kind of draw, well, who are you to know more than me? And then people want to use anecdotal evidence and say, well, you don't know what I've experienced. I've talked to people before about, about my views about the afterlife and what happens to the dead when they leave. And they'll say, but you don't understand. Somebody came to me, passed away, and they stood at the foot of my bed. I saw them there. And, 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 I, and, and they want to say, well, they were a believer. They believed in God. And I said, well, you know, the Bible kind of says that, you know, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm not sure exactly what all that means, but I don't think they're standing at the foot of your bed on a regular basis. So I might suggest to them that there's a spirit at the foot of their bed trying to make them think it's this person because the spirit world wants to keep us unfocused on Jesus Christ. So they want to keep us on focus on things that come up short of Jesus Christ. So it kind of is perplexing to people. People have these beliefs, and they all, everybody has anecdotal evidence. They'll say, you don't understand, it happened to me. And, and, and so being a, a teacher and preacher of the Scripture, I fall back on that. I try to stay out of guessing as often as possible, but even handling the Scripture, at some point, it's the best guess. It's just the best guess. We just, we can't explain these things. So when Paul's in this place, he's very aware. He has presence of mind with everything that he does. He's walking around, he's praying about. And I can just see him saying, Lord, please give me a way to talk to these people. Lord, please give me a message that these people here would understand so that I can glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's his whole purpose, to lead people into a transformational relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, those are modern terms for let me evangelize these lost folks and lead them to Jesus. Amen? And so Paul, praying and seeking, he begins to speak about Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus and the resurrection. Now, some people believe because one of the Latin words for resurrection sounds like a female term, that Paul was preaching two deities, one named Yeshua and one this other name that meant resurrection. I don't know if that's true or not, because in there they said he's a preacher of strange deities. But I think they were so used to a common, it was common to have deities everywhere. Everybody had a multiplicity of gods. They just they, they followed this group or they followed that group or they had some sort of hodgepodge of that group and this group combined. Everybody had multiple deities they, they believe existed. So to preach that, that God had a son was no big deal for them. Have you read the story of Zeus and Hercules? You know, the, a God had a son. It was a common belief. It wasn't anything strange to believe that a God, a God and a human being had a baby. That's what they taught in the Roman pantheon and the Greek pantheon. So when, when they would preach that, that God the Father had a, had a son through Mary, people were like, sure, I get that. We know about Hercules, and we know about all these other gods that, that were born, that, that were, were children of gods. It's not a strange thing that, thing that I'm at all. But, but Paul was preaching Jesus crucified and risen again. He didn't blow their mind when he said God had a son. 
They're like, yeah, it's common. Been going on for a long time. Didn't blow their mind at all. Now you go to a modern person who, who, who doesn't believe in all this pantheon of gods and say, God had a child with a woman. And they're like, well, how does that work? And, and, and they, they begin to turn you off immediately. So Paul looked for a way to connect. And I want to tell you, saints, I believe that we have the same struggle today. How do we connect in this modern age? I mean, we read what Paul did here and how he dealt with them. I believe one of the ways that we do is we pray as Paul prayed. Lord, please give me a way to connect to those people that are around me that don't know Jesus as their Savior. Lord, give me a way to connect. And, 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 and I can remember in the, how many of you remember lifestyle evangelism? That was a big deal because I was a fundamentalist and lifestyle evangelism was a heresy. But at the same time, there were a lot of people that were practicing lifestyle evangelism, which means you live in such a way, as Peter said, that people begin to ask you, what is it that's in you that gives you such a hope? And, and when people are asking you about the hope that's within you, you can then tell them about Jesus. Well, Peter said, do that. The problem is, I haven't really been asked by many people in my life, what is it that gives you so much joy? What is it that makes you Christians happy? And I think the problem is they're not seeing a lot of happy Christians, right? They're just not asking that because, well, we're the person in the car with the bumper stickers shouting at the person in front of us letting somebody cross the road. We're upset because we got somewhere to be. We're, we're, we're entangled in this world. This world is affecting us. And so Paul searching for a way to reach these people. And, and he had his opportunity. He was invited up on Mars Hill. Now, Mars is a god. Area... Areopagus is the word here, which means hill of Ares. It was a place where Ares evidently was able to war there and protect them. And so they had Mars and had Ares. Again, Greek and Roman gods. And, and in my, my translation, it says Areopagus, which is the hill of Ares. So he's standing there in this place. Now he can see, he can see the Parthenon. He can see from there this huge temple that one of the one of the wonders of the ancient world was built there he could he could see he's he's within sight of that and he says i was walking around your town i noticed that you're very very religious now another way to translate that word is superstitious but i don't think paul meant superstitious because people don't handle that very well you ever tell somebody that is superstitious they're being superstitious they get offended I saw somebody spill a bunch of salt last night on the table, and I, and I wondered if they were going to throw it over their shoulder because that's what people do because we're superstitious, right? Anybody here won't walk under a ladder? Don't let a black cat cross? But if somebody says, well, that's just being superstitious, we get a little bit offended at that, don't we? A lot of those things, have you heard this? Knock on wood? Or I do this, yeah. Right? Knock on wood, it goes back, it's an ancient Celtic thing that when you would pass through a, through a grove of trees, of oak trees, you didn't want to make the gods of the trees upset, so what would you do? Just passing through. Please allow me to pass. Well, that, that stuff gets lost in history, and we always hear, well, I'm going to do that unless something bad happens. Knock on wood, right? Because we don't think the bad happens, so we're going to knock on wood to appease the gods. That's not what we mean by that. But that's how these things are derived and how we get these things in our modern text. So listen to what Paul does. He says, I noticed that you had an altar to the unknown God. Well, here's what's interesting about that. There's this guy that lived 600 B.C. I'm going to read the name because I won't, be, I won't get it right. Epimenides. Epimenides. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of Epimenides, but he's actually from the place Paul's from. He's from up around Crete. He was a Cretan. And he was a famous philosopher and soothsayer. Now, how many of you know the story of the Pied Piper? Right, he came in and began to play and all the mice followed him out of town. Well, Epimenides is, is a very similar thing. In, in, in 600 years before Jesus Christ, Athens has a pestilence that settles into the land. Now, we don't really know what the pestilence was. There, but there's a lot of writing about the pestilence that was there. And, and they weren't sure what it was because Athens had kind of got away from worshiping gods. So 600 years before Christ, they kind of let the worship of the gods go. They, they were on the ver verge of the, the golden era of philosophy. They were thinkers. And you know what first thing thinkers do? They usually jettison any kind of spiritual language. Um, people, you've heard people today, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. Okay? It's just, it's just a different God by another name. 
I believe in the God of science. Amen. Amen. You couldn't even test things if God hadn't made them. So, and, and the laws that are out there that we've learned, well, this is God. Uh, one of my favorite ones is, is that it takes life to make life. Yet they also want to teach that we came from nothing. So how's that, the law, it takes life to make life, work with we came from nothing? So they work their way around that. But, but they, they begin to be philosophical, and so they begin to leave their religion. They begin to leave their God, 600 B.C., in that era. They didn't know what to do because this pestilence came in. And, and they went to the oracle at Delphi. Remember, I talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And, and they asked the oracle, what should we do to fight this pestilence? Well, the oracle at Delphi said, you need to go get Epimenides and bring him down, and he'll guide you. He was famous at that time. He'd written a lot of things. And so they went and got Epimenides. And they said, what should we do with the pestilence that's here in Athens? And he was religious. Not a God follower like we would consider. He was religious. He believed in the gods. And he realized that Athens had got, left their gods behind. He said, here's what you need to do. You need to offer sacrifices to the gods. And so he brought in these black sheep and he brought in these white sheep. The black sheep represented the gods of the underworld, the dark powers. The white sheep represented the, the friendly gods that would bring you life and health and vitality. He said he turned out these hundreds of sheep in Athens. And he had people follow these sheep around. He says everywhere that a sheep lies down offer a sacrifice to the different gods. And if you don't know, offer sacrifices to the unknown gods. So 600 years before Paul gets to Athens, they turn out all these sheep because this is what Epimenides says do. And everywhere one lay down, they would make an altar. And the vast majority of the altars were to the unknown god. Because they didn't want to make any of them mad. Now they had some gods that they knew, but there's always a chance there's a god you don't know about, right? I mean, when there's hundreds of gods, there's an opportunity for there to be a god that's mad at you that you don't want to, that you don't know, and so you want to appease this god as well. And so he says, offer sacrifices to unknown gods. When a when a lamb lies down, set up an altar and offer a sacrifice right there to the unknown god. Six hundred years later. God's servant Paul is walking through this land. And as he's walking through the land, he sees these relics 600 years old to the unknown God. Now, Paul is very educated. He's so educated that he knows Epimenides. He has read Epimenides. He's also read the Stoics and the Epicureans. Paul is very, very well read. Now, the Stoics were the philosophers that believed that... No matter what happens in life, to find peace, to find happiness, you've just got to let the pain of the world go. You've just got to be stoic about it. And, and, and the Epicureans were like, well, if you really want to find joy in life, because the world is full of bad stuff, you should find anything that makes you happy and do it. They're still around today, aren't they? Some are still keeping the stiff upper lip. And some are like, if it makes me happy, I'm going to do it. So these were the ones that heard him arguing. And Paul was talking about, you want to really be happy? You need forgiveness of sin by Jesus Christ. And then you'll spend eternal, eternal life after the resurrection with God the Father. And they're like, okay, that's a different kind of happiness than either one of us know about. So these are the ones that heard him talking. And they're like, we need to bring you up on our hill where we discuss things. And so Paul was invited in to their midst. Paul was well educated. Paul was well read. And look at what he does. He knows about Epimenides. So he gets in there and he says, I notice that you're very, very religious. You've even got altars to unknown gods. He says, let me tell you about that God. The one that you say you don't know, you admit you don't know, you've got altars to, I can tell you who he is. You see, Paul found a way through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to reach the people who had for themselves acknowledged that there's a God out there we don't know. And he says, I would love to introduce you to this God you don't know. 
And he begins to describe to them the God and the Creator of the world. He said He made all things. He doesn't inhabit temples. He doesn't live in those. He created all things and everything that's out there, He made. He, well, there's not a God of the sea and a God of the rock and a God of the tree because of, of the Epicureans and the Stoics, a lot of them were kind of pantheists that God was in everything and everything was a God. So you could have thousands of gods, anything you could possibly set up to worship, there must be a God that goes with it. And so about Paul knowing that they were very religious. He says, I know you're looking to worship. And I know you want to worship that unknown God. Let me introduce you to him. I love that about Paul. He was very aware. He was aware of things that were around him. He was well educated. He knew what was happening in the world that he lived in. I dare say that we're living in a very similar world to Paul. There's a lot of people that have heard of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They think they know Jesus. They think because they get on YouTube. And anybody that has a camera and a microphone is spouting their philosophy on YouTube, much as it was in Athens 2,000 years ago. And they're telling you that Jesus didn't actually ever live. They're telling you that Jesus is, and everything that Christians have come up with, is just some sort of pagan worship that we've Christianized. Have you heard that one? They'll go back and say, well, Christmas, the day that Christ is supposedly born, was actually a day where, where they would worship the birth of Zoroaster. Or, or, or they would worship this, or they would worship that. They, they'll tell you that one of the titles for Zoroaster is the light of the world. And then they'll go ahead and say, there's also another God that they worshipped. His name was Lagos. And you'll go back and read John. It says, in the beginning was the Lagos, and the Lagos was with God, and the Lagos was God. And they're like, see, Christianity is still... So everywhere we go, people have been convinced that there is no Jesus. Or that we are deluded because people that are wiser than us can explain it away. Very similar to what Paul was facing. I believe that we, meet, we need to be a lot like Paul. We need to be in prayer. We need to be burdened for those that are around us that are far from Jesus. But you know, one of the things I've noticed is that we'd rather get mad or offended at somebody that says something about Christ. We don't need to defend Jesus. He can handle it. We don't need to defend the Word of God. It can handle it. We don't need to be drawn into these debates and these, these conversations about nothing. Like how many angels can dance on the head of the pen? Angels are Baptists. They don't dance. So y'all still listening? How many angels can dance on the head of the pen? Words about nothing. What did Paul say? Endless genealogies in his day. Well, who are you part of? And, and this person, and this person, and this person. And I can trace it back. And, then I can, and, and there are churches today that will tell me my baptism doesn't count because I wasn't baptized by somebody who was baptized according to ap ap apostolic succession to John the Baptist. I, I know people that believe that. If you weren't baptized by the right people, your baptism doesn't count. Endless arguing. Endless debating. But there's a, there's a way of wisdom. And it begins with prayer. Well, it begins with concern. If we don't care about the lost world around us, nobody's going to reach them. If, if, if we don't love those that differ from us, we're never going to reach them. I remember when 911 happened. And the, the marching cry was, kill them all. Let's send a nuclear warhead and just make a sheet of glass in the desert. It's like, yeah, I don't know that that's what Jesus... That sounds like... But doesn't it sound like John and his brother? James and John? Didn't they say, shall we call down fire from heaven, Lord? Because this village doesn't want you to pass through? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Well, that would have preached at 911. Kill them all. How do we reach those that seem unreachable? How do we reach those that differ from us? Or the hardest ones are the ones that are inoculated. You know what inoculated is, right? You got just enough of the real thing, you can't catch it. 
although that didn't work with COVID, but that's a whole other thing. Do you realize just because I just said that word, YouTube is going to flag this message? They're going to flag that message because I said that word, and they're going to say, if you want real information about that, go here. Now, they won't keep me from uploading it, but because every time I say that word, it gets flagged. I still say the word because I'm still preaching the word. They haven't taken me off the air for it because I haven't said anything scientifically one way or the other about it. But there are a lot of people in our, in our communities and in our families that are inoculated. They've heard of Jesus their whole life. They don't know they need him. They don't know that they're sinners. They don't know that they've ever done anything wrong. And we made sure of that in the late 80s when we began teaching our kids. You're the most important thing on the face of the earth. There's nothing wrong with you at all. Everything you think about yourself is correct. Here's a participation trophy. Thank you for showing up. You know what I think became the height of weirdness? And, and if this is you, I don't mean to offend you, but I thought it was weird. You go to a birthday party. And you leave with a gift. Now, when I was growing up, you went to a birthday party. You took a gift for the birthday kid, right? Now you go to a birthday party, and the birthday kid gives you a gift. Everybody gets a parting gift. Now, I wouldn't complain about that. I'll take my gift and go. But I thought that was weird that we go to parties now and get gifts. I mean, things have kind of flipped over. So what do we do? Do we just talk about it and complain about it? No. How do we reach those who need Jesus? I think we have to be like Paul. I think we have to be burdened by the people that are around us that need Jesus. And I think we need to be in prayer about how we're going to reach those. The saying that Jesus said, the fields are white with harvest. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest to send workers. I think that prayer is still relevant today. Here's what's interesting. Paul's, Paul's two quotes here. In verse 28, it says, In him we live and move and have our being. Here's what's funny about that. That's a quote from Epimenides. 600 years before Paul said it. This is a philosopher's quote. And then he goes on down and says, Even some of your own poets say, For we are indeed his offspring. That's from a guy named Eratus, who was about 300 years B.C. Came from the same place that Paul came from. Paul was familiar with what they believed. He acquainted himself. So Paul had the presence of mind. He knew history. He knew the need. And he knew inspiration through the Spirit. I can just imagine when Paul's walking through the streets. He's burdened. He looked around. There's idols everywhere. Probably the, the Jewish nature in him was pricked and bothered because... This is one of the commandments, and they've got idols everywhere. But at the same time, he was like, Lord, how do I reach these people? And I just think the Spirit of the Lord spoke to Paul says, do it through their own writings. Do it with the things that they believe. Show them the truth behind their own sayings, that there is one God. His name is Jesus. He died for your sins. And he's going to resurrect. He preached the resurrection. You know, the moment he said resurrection, they said, we're done listening. We're, nope, uh-uh, that can't happen. We know better. And so the, the, the fact that they believed all these gods, but none of them had the resurrection power, and there's only one God with resurrection power. He raised Christ from the dead. Be not deceived, though. Christ is God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for the day that you've given us, for walking with us and teaching us and guiding us here. Lord, I pray that you will help us in this time of meditation as we prepare this morning to, to have a time of invitation as we meditate on the word that's been preached and the songs that have been sung and the glory that we've offered to you, Lord God. I pray that you receive our worship, receive our praise. And Father, I pray that you will stir in our hearts and in our minds this day so that we will be burdened for those that are around us that are lost and isolated and separated from you. And that, Father, we would, we would be praying for a way to reach them in their life. Father, I, I pray you'd open our eyes and help us to see the path 
so that we can proclaim Jesus to those that need him in our lives, not only today, but tomorrow and for the rest of our existence. Help us this day as we enter into a time of invitation. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.